Let's talk about one of the biggest laws in queuing theory, which is called Little's Law, named after the person who discovered it or formalized it, uh, John Little. Uh, it is L equals lambda times W, and LQ equals lambda times WQ. Along with W equals WQ plus 1 over mu, this says if I give you any one of L, LQ, W, and WQ, you can compute the other three easily. The thing is, it doesn't actually compute any one of them in the first place. You have to do fancier things to get that. It also applies to even infinite server systems, where WQ is zero because nobody ever waits in line, they get straight into service, and W equals one over mu, just the average time in the system is one over the average service rate. Let's take a quick second to apply this to a simple situation. Let's say medical school has 100 people per entering class, and the average time spent in the medical school is four years, how many students are at the school? Well, you could probably say, well, four, there's 100 first year students, 100 second year students, 100 third year, 100 fourth year, so 400. If we phrase it in terms of Little's Law, what is 100? Is that more like uh, an average service time? Is that an arrival rate? Is that a number in the system? Well, that's kind of an arrival rate, 100 per year, so that would be lambda. Average time spent in the school is four years, that's an average service duration, so that would be uh, W, that's the average time someone spends, and so we're saying lambda of 100 times W of 4 gives us 400, and that would be the average number of people in the system, which is L. So it makes some intuitive sense, hopefully. Um, but it also applies when we have uh, not infinite servers and people have to wait in line sometimes. Uh, it can also apply to just the servers, um, but we won't worry about that. There's a manufacturing interpretation of it to say that our inventory level or our work in process, WIP, is equal to our throughput rate, how many jobs per month or whatever, times the flow time for any one particular job on average, and that's parallel to L equals lambda W. So how do we actually solve queues in the first place? Well, we start by formulating a Markov chain, which is usually a continuous time Markov chain for MM1, MMC, uh, or some of the others. Uh, it's a discrete time Markov chain for MG1, that's general service times, or GM1, that's general inter-arrival times. Uh, then from that Markov chain, we find the steady state probabilities. From those, we compute the average number in the system or the average number waiting in line. And from that, we can compute W and WQ using Little's Law. So let's talk about um, the basic assumptions that go into this uh, for the most simple Q that we often deal with, which is MM1. So the first M means memoryless arrivals, so arrivals according to a Poisson process. Uh, so just to review, if you haven't, if you've seen this already, or uh, to give you a hint, if you haven't, that means if we put a dot down on a timeline each time a call arrives, the dots aren't all evenly spaced. They come in lots of uh, little clusters, and then there's gaps between them. Uh, and the histogram of the time between calls falls off like an exponential distribution. Um, and then the service time distribution also has an exponential fall off to its histogram. So that means the standard deviation of the service times is about equal to the mean, like the average talk time is five minutes plus or minus five minutes. So that's what memoryless um, uh, service times look like. So let's just give you this, the main formula for an MM1. Remember that our traffic amount, called rho, is lambda over mu, so arrival rate divided by service rate. So for an MM1, after doing all that continuous time Markov chain stuff, we get that L equals rho over 1 minus rho. It's interesting that L doesn't depend on lambda and mu separately, only on their ratio. Uh, so that's good because then if I change units from like hours to minutes, both lambda and mu change by a factor of 60, but the traffic doesn't change at all because the factors of 60 wash out, and so I still have the same average service time, uh, average number in the system. Let's give this formula a little bit of practice. You can actually compute this in your head uh, if you give it a second or two. If rho is 0.5, what is L? It's rho over 1 minus rho. Then try it again at 0.8, try it again at 0.9, try it again at 0.99. So for rho is 0.5, you get 0.5 divided by 1 minus 0.5, which is 1. 
for 0.8, you get 0.8 divided by 0.2, which is 4. For 0.9, you get 0.9 divided by 0.1, which is 9. For 0.99, we get 0.99 divided by 0.01, which is 99. So if you're driving a MM1Q at 99% utilization, traffic of 0.99, your average number in the system is going to be 99 people when there's only one server. That's a pretty long line. Let's try this again and make a graph. Let's use row equals 0, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, 0 0.9, and 0.99 and use markers with connecting straight lines, and then try it again using markers with connecting smooth lines in Excel, and think about what's going on there. So pause the video while you do that, and let's uh, go try that here. I've got row of 0, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, 0 0.9, 0 0.99, and I've got row over one minus row in my second column, and I'll just graph that markers with connecting straight lines, so it uh, starts at 0, 0, and it increases kind of slowly until we get past about 0.8, and then it just shoots up to something near 100. We already kind of did those calculations. Uh, would you say this is exponential growth? Kind of seems like it, but it's actually faster than exponential growth because this goes to infinity at x equals 1, and exponential growth never actually gets to infinity. So this is faster than exponential growth. I know we usually say exponential growth is like the fastest thing ever, but no, this is worse. Um, let's try it with uh, markers with smooth connecting lines and see what happens. Um, now we see the smooth lines increase along with the dots up to 0.75, but then between 0.75 and uh, 0.9, the smooth line actually dips down a little bit kind of so it can make that sudden left turn as it's mo moving up this way. Um, so it's kind of like a semi-truck swinging wide one way to make a sharp turn. But this gives the wrong impression that the average number in system actually dips as you increase the utilization. So that's why I hardly ever use smooth connecting lines, because they can give the wrong impression in situations like this. Let's go back to thinking about those really high utilizations. If row is 0.99 and you spend 10% more money to make the server go 10% faster, whether it's a human and you just pay to train them a little better, or it's a machine and you pay to get a faster machine, or you just run it faster and pay the maintenance cost later. So now our server is running 10% faster, so traffic has decreased from 0.99 to 0.9, so traffic decreased by 10%. By what percent does L increase? Well, if we think back to the table we had here, at 0.99 we had 99 people in the system on average, and at 0.9 we had 9 people. So for a 10% increase in service rate, we got a 90% decrease in the number of people in the system. That is a huge payoff, right? This is why we don't want to drive utilization up near one, even though it seems cost efficient in terms of paying servers. It, uh, it can really, really lead to long lines to have really large um, utilizations. And you can make customers a lot happier by just spending a little bit more money to get service faster. We looked at um, the, L, the L graph for an MM1. The WQ graph is pretty much the same kind of thing. It starts at the origin, and as you move over toward the utilization of 1, it increases, and not by much until you get to, to about 0.8 or so, and then it really has a sharp turn and zooms up toward infinity as you get near 1. Um, you might think, are there things I can do to be smarter about um, ordering my service, maybe? Can I get better by doing better service ordering. So we might do, we usually think of first come, first serve, FCFS, or also called first in, first out, uh, FIFO, FIFO. You might think, what if I do last come, first serve, uh, or LIFO? Um, or uh, in some situations, you just kind of grab whatever part is in your bin, and it got added there in random order, so it might be service in random order, or RSS, randomly selected service. It turns out these all have the same averages, L, LQ, W, WQ. So in some sense, you can't get your line to be shorter by switching between these three. Uh, first come, first serve has the lowest wait time variance, 
um, last come first serve. Some people get through real fast. Other people take a long time to get through the system because they had to wait for all the people who arrived before them, uh, after them, sorry. So is there any way of ordering jobs that can actually reduce the average waiting time? Try to wonder what that might be. Well, turns out shortest job first can reduce the average waiting time. But the problem is then you need an estimate of how long the service time for each job is gonna be. You can also do in some cases shortest remaining processing time. If you can interrupt jobs and put on other jobs that come in, um, in the meantime, if they have a lower estimated time, but either of these can really slow down long jobs. Uh, you could also do round robin, and that's kind of what computers do. You give each job a little slice of time, like five milliseconds, and then go on to the next job, give that a little slice of time. Um, so all kinds of fun stuff you can do there. Um, some other important MM1 facts. Uh, the waiting time, if you get delayed, has an exponential distribution. So if you get delayed, maybe your mean wait will be five minutes, and that's plus or minus five minutes, which is kind of depressing. The number of people in the system has a geometric distribution, which means its standard deviation is roughly equal to its mean. So if you have a mean line length of 10 people, your standard deviation is also 10. So you need to plan to have like 30 or 40 chairs there, like the mean plus three or four standard deviations. And the probability that the system is empty is just one minus the utilization. So um, one place you might hope to apply MM1 thinking is to internet traffic. If you have a router, that's a single server. But it turns out the arrival of data packets is not at all a Poisson process. In fact, it has cool fractally kind of patterns. Um, usually for a Poisson process, averaging over longer and longer time spans gives us less proportional variability. But that is not true for data networks, even though people assumed it was true for decades. And then in the 90s, uh, Willinger and Paxson uh, actually did some measurements and found out, wow, that assumption is very, very wrong. So there's a lot of interesting math to do there. Um, and let me know if you're interested in that.